Everybody that came to Nicaea was like missing a limb or an eye or something because they had been persecuted for the church. And at that council, they kind of loosened things up. They said, let's incorporate this and let's incorporate that. Maybe we can bring some more pagans in. We can get a, a larger group. And this is why Patrick did not like that. You know, he just didn't go along with that. And so, yeah, syncretism is the name of the games for Roman Catholicism. Where, you know, all the saints used to be pagan entities. The Lineage Journey podcast, unscripted conversations that aim to help you on the journey of discovering your lineage. Join us as we take a deeper look into past lineage episodes and see the lessons we can learn for today. Don McIntosh is a man who wears many hats. He is an ordained minister and currently pastors the Wema Seventh-day Adventist Church in California, though formerly he pastored in Kansas, where I had the opportunity to work with him. He runs the health program at Wema, is a professor of religion, he lectures on mental health, and is also a qualified nurse. He also was formerly the director of the Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism. He performed a wedding and has strong Scottish roots and is passionate about unearthing the lessons from the past for our learning today. We would say we have Pastor Don McIntosh. Pastor Don McIntosh currently works at Weimar Institute and holds many hats here, about seven or eight, if I'm correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, sometimes when a place is growing and then you hand stuff off. So there's a lot of stuff I've handed off, but right now I teach in the religion department and I do some spiritual counseling for the Nelly Depression and an anxiety recovery program that's focused mm -hmm. here on the campus. And then there is a health evangelism um, school that um, is supposed to spread principles around the world, kind of like what we're going to be talking about today. Mm. Yeah. Great. So, but you, your name is Macintosh, and you don't need to understand much about names and, and people to understand that Macintosh name comes from a particular, particular part of the world. Right. Uh, which is which country? Well, you know, it's Scotland and Wales, that area. Inverness is a lot of uh, Macintoshes, not too far from Inverness. And my particular family came from a place called Killin, which is near Inverness. And I went over there, and it was kind of uh, unsettling to see Donald Macintosh on multiple tombstones with green covered moss. <laughs> so there's a lot of them there. And, uh, and then my family, uh, there was a, you know, there were a number of famines and different things that happened there in the old country, but they migrated down to a place in Wales that's La Trisant, I think it's, it's called. It's not too far from Bristol, but it used to be in an area that used to be Wales, but then used to be England. And the homestead is still there. You can go visit it, and I can see where my ancestors lived. Um, and and uh, my great-grandfather was the person who came to America. He came over to America in the 1800s and and converted to the Adventist faith um, in around, you know, the 1880s, 1890. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah. And, and, uh, and yet a lot of Scottish history, and I've been over there several times to visit the family. Not too many of the family are still there. They don't live there in that particular area. I haven't looked them up specifically, but the people that live there, they knew a lot about, of course, our history there living in that house. Okay, wow. Now, I understand you went to um, a place we're going to talk about in this episode on your honeymoon, if I'm correct. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of hard to talk my wife into this. She didn't know what she was getting into. But, yeah, I took her to Iona, so, okay. and that's the, a Scottish mission. And that was a great place for a honeymoon. There's, there's no distractions. <laughs> Very good. I've been to Iona a few times. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely place, really on the edge of the world. But... We're going to get into the Celtic Church. Maybe in a nutshell, do you mind sharing, when we talk about the Celtic Celtic Church, what are we referring to, geographical region or time period, etc.? Well, I'm not an expert in the Celtic Church, but there is a great book by Leslie Harding called The Celtic Church <clears throat> that is probably the definitive study on the Celts. And he wrote that book for his PhD at the University, I think, of London. And it talks about how the Celts were many different places. Um, I don't know exactly their origin, but let's just say it's, people would say it's Scottish in Ireland and Scotland, 
but they went as far afield as, you know, down in Turkey or down to the Galatia area. In fact, the epistle to the Galatians was addressed to a Celtic church community. So if you want to get a, an idea of some of the issues they were dealing with in the, one of those areas, read the book of Galatians. Hmm. And um, so, yeah, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but it was kind of a fusing of uh, an so exist. So started there, out. There was an existent Druids. Have you ever heard of Druids mm -hmm. and whatnot that were um, there in Scotland and Ireland, and then they, they went other places. And you can see the Celtic cross, which has a circle as well as a cross together. And the circle is somewhat hinting towards the Celtic worldview. Mm. And there's not, um, I haven't read a lot on that. There's much more probably than, than I'm probably at the, the depth of my knowledge of that. Okay. So uh, I'm getting a little bit that the Celtic church was in many different places, but it, would you say over time it kind of retreated or? Oh yeah. It retreated back because it came into conflict with the, uh, the Roman um, influence later on, and um, ultimately the Roman Church or the Catholic mm -hmm. Church, and it began to recruit, recruit retreat, retreat rather back to Scotland and Ireland um, as a result of that. And they never did really, you know, uh, Rome never really did conquer the what were called the Picts or the Scots. They were quite a fearsome people, mm -hmm. yeah. and so instead of, you know, instead of trying to conquer them. They to try to just keep them out, and they built um, Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall. It's fascinating that they built a wall to keep people out, rather than, you know, they were such a great conquering empire, and yet they they, they drew a line when it came to Scotland. Yeah, exactly. Um, they, I guess you know today they people like to build walls. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go into Patrick a little bit. Um, maybe just we never did an episode on Patrick. We did do an episode for lineage on Iona. We did an episode on Aidan and. And Columbanus and Whitby, but we never covered Patrick. And I, we, we do want to go back and cover him sometime. But what role did he play? And, and, and could you just give us maybe a little bit of insight into Patrick and who he was as, uh, as a person and, and so on? Because today we have a St. Patrick Day, but uh, I'm not sure what people celebrate today is who he was. Yeah, you know, Patrick uh, um, predated, of course, Protestantism. So mm -hmm. he wasn't a Protestant and he wasn't a Catholic. He was mm -hmm. neither. And so if you go over that and you ask who Patrick was, they'll say he was just a Christian. But depending on who the tour guide is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they'll try and co-opt him. But Patrick was born actually in Scotland. He was born along um, where Hadrian's Wall would be. Um, and there's a certain fort. I can't remember the name of it. It starts with a K, I think. But he was born there. And then he got kidnapped and was taken to Ireland. And he worked as a shepherd for a while, for a number of years. And then he came back to Scotland, but he had a burden for Ireland, and he went back as a missionary there. Um, and uh, he studied the Bible. Um, they had their own translation of the Bible. The Celts did. The Patrick did, ultimately. And it largely was the Pentateuch at first, the first five books of the Bible. And um, in that, as they studied that, you know, um, they came, became aware of many different things. I don't know if you want me to get into that too yeah, much. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, but he, uh, he lived about 100 years after the Council, Council of Nicaea. And the Council of Nicaea was, you know, a Catholic council, a universal council that set up Sunday as the Sabbath day and stopped Saturday worship formally with the Roman Church and then it incorporated a bunch of pagan traditions to try and bring everybody into the Roman church. Mm -hmm. And um, and before the Council of Nicaea, for instance, there were some people, many people that were keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath. Um, so when the Pope sent a bishop to Ireland, Patrick refused, number one, to bow down to the bishop. And because that the Pope told the bishop to tell him that they didn't believe in the Sabbath, they thought they had condemned, they had condemned, you know, Sabbatarianism. Um, so he didn't like that because they kept the Sabbath. He didn't like the fact that Patrick um, and his fellow priests had wives. They married. Um, and this was a major bone of contention between the Catholics and the church in Ireland. Um, there were some monks sent by the Catholic Church to England in 596 A.D. And 
Pope Gregory then now was the Pope, and he saw there was such a great difference between this and what was ultimately called the Celtic Church that, you know, they didn't know exactly what to do. Augustine himself tried to reason with them, but they would never give up their wives, and they had a different mode of baptism. You know, they didn't do sprinkling. Mm -mm. They did immersion, um, and that was different than the Roman Church, and they had their own councils. And they enacted their own laws. And this one didn't go well with the Pope and mm. his councils. And they also, they had their own Bible. Like I said, it was a Latin Bible. It was not the Latin Vulgate of Jerome, mm-hmm. which would have been the fourth century. This was, it's called Itala. Itala, it was Latin. It was unlike their Bible. And again, they, they kept the Sabbath. And also, they kept the health laws. They actually... Um, did not, um, uh, you know, you, if you just read the Pentateuch, you can see in Genesis and other places that there are clean and unclean meats, and there's actually a preferred diet in Genesis 129. Mm-hmm. They were familiar with that. Hmm. Now, the Catholic Church, you know, tried to co opt him, you know, Patrick, their history, and tries to prove that he was a Catholic, but it, just, it doesn't match up um, with what we're saying. Mm-hmm. In fact, he would get into altercations over doctrinal issues and whatnot with them. So he was definitely not a Catholic. But there was another guy named Palladius, whose name was also Patrick. And some people think they conflate those two histories. Palladius was sent by the Catholic Church to Scotland, or rather to Ireland. And so some people think they maybe conflated those two things, put those two things together in the past. But certainly Patrick... Yeah, as that, we know of from from Iona, was not a Roman Catholic. Mm, I think that's a key point because, I mean, St. Patrick there what is it, sometime in March the 17th or 18th or somewhere around there, and everyone celebrates St. Patrick as this great Catholic hero, and yet the little bit I've read on him, he he clearly wasn't. He opposed the, the priest and those who came over, and I don't know, is it a case of if you can't beat them, make, make them one of yours or something like that? Well, this is certainly the point of Nicaea, right? The Council of Nicaea was everybody that came to Nicaea was like missing a limb or an eye or something because they had been persecuted for the church. And at that council, they kind of loosened things up. They said, let's incorporate this and let's incorporate that. Maybe we can bring some more pagans in. We can get a a larger group. And Mm. this is why Patrick did not like that. Mm. You know, he just didn't go along with that. And so, yeah, syncretism is the name of the games for Roman Catholicism. Mm. You know, all the saints used to be pagan entities. Convert them to Christian. Yeah, right. So Patrick's there in Ireland, and then another, I guess, another uh, another person who comes on the scene is Columba. Um, Columba, we believe, starts in, in, in Ireland, and then he goes to Scotland. Am I correct there? Yeah, you know... I'm not sure exactly the origin of Columba, um, <clears throat> but he certainly is involved. I think Ireland coming to Scotland, and then he comes to actually Iona. Mm. And he, uh, Columba is a very interesting name itself. Columba means the dove. So, uh, and the dove, of course, is an allusion in scripture to the spirit, the Holy Spirit. And, you know, there's very Scottish names. Like one of my, my boy's name is, is Malcolm. Mal means the follower of, Calum means the dove. So people that follow the Holy Spirit. When Mm. you go to Edinburgh, you know, you have Malcolm and Margaret (laughs) there in that chapel. Mm -hmm. When you go to the palace there. But the Malcolmites, you know. So a lot of people named Malcolm. My great-grandfather was named Malcolm. A lot of Malcolms in my family. A lot of Donalds in my family. Um, But follower of the dove. And Calum, you know, Columba was, again, kind of like Patrick in that, studied the scriptures, studied the Old Testament, became a vegetarian. <laughs> uh, and also Columba and the, and the Celts and whatnot, they also had a real focus on kindness to animals. Don't mistreat animals. This is big in the Old Testament too, you know, even the Sabbath commandment, which they also kept the Sabbath, would, you know, give a break to the servants, give a break hmm. to the animals. But I was reading recently that some of the followers of Columba they, they felt so strongly that the animals should not be mistreated that they would actually plow the fields. They would have. <laughs> by human power. Yeah, by human power. 
rather than having animals because they believe these were God's creatures. You shouldn't be just conscripting them to labor. So they had a lot of the touch points that people here in California might like today, you know, <laughs> care for the animals, don't eat meat, um, and also some of the many things that that the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know, has a, a great theology of ecology, you might say. They they leave a, a small carbon footprint. Some people have said, you know, you don't have to do all of these different changes that they're talking about if everybody just became a vegetarian. If people call, you know, followed Columba and Patrick, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have to do all kinds. I mean, they say, look, let's throw all kinds of money at this. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's get a, rid of the pollution. Some of the biggest pollution comes from the exploitation of animals and whatnot. And Com Columba and even Columbanus, one of his followers, they were vegetarians on the basis of studying the Pentateuch. Hmm. Fascinating. Now, just to go back to something you mentioned earlier. You said that they were Sabbath keepers. Mm -hmm. um, is, was that pervasive amongst what we would call the Celtic church or was it a bit hit and miss? Some were, some weren't. Or would is it fair to say that the Celtic Church, say in Iona, Scotland, or or parts of Ireland, that they were kind of Sabbath keepers across the board? Or is it still? No, it. I mean, there are you know Leslie Harding in his book documents the various sources, which I can't mm -hmm. remember, but there are a number of historical sources that show that not only did they give the land a seven year rest, they also took a rest every seven days. So trying to follow. Hmm. you know, what the Bible says about agriculture and, and then the Sabbath itself. So there's no doubt that they were um, pervasively Sabbatarian, at least at Iona. And Iona was a training center. Mm -hmm. So they sent people, you know, kind of like your evangelism school over there. They sent people all over the place and um, and they were Sabbatarian. And this is this is what Leslie Hardy brings out. Now, they had a training center there. Do you know much about what they trained or how long it was? Or, I mean, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know except for what I've read. They, they kind of, at least some accounts say that they didn't necessarily want to be missional and sending people out as much as they wanted to model what it would be like to live in a close uh, cloistered community uh, there on that island. But then, of course, they did go out. Um, what did they teach? Essentially, Leslie Harding in his book talks about how they were people of the book. They basically let scripture interpret itself. They took it very literally. And so they were teaching the Bible. They were teaching. Uh, they had wonderful artwork in, mm. the, in the copies of their Bible. They had uh, splendid artwork. Um, they had music, you know, so music, scripture. Um, and some people say, I don't know, it might be an apocryphal account that, that, uh, Patrick himself was sent to be a missionary to Scotland after he killed some people in Ireland. And they said, look, you got to win as many people as you killed. <laughs> and it was, they got in a fight over a hymn book or a Psalter, they called it back then. Um, so yeah, they, they would send people out and, uh, and they would evangelize. And like I said, they went far afield, the Celts went far afield, and then they kind of got beat back by the Roman Catholic Church. Mm. Um, but they were as far as Galatia, the, like I mentioned, the book of Galatians was written to a Celtic community. So even the New Testament, we have a book that's written to a largely Celtic church. After the break, we're going to look a little bit more at the impact of the training center at Iona. How did it expand? Where did it go? Who were some of the disciples? How did the impact of the Celtic Church diminish and, and how was it extinguished, so to speak, over time? And, and what are the implications and lessons for us today? So join us after the break. Lineage is a nonprofit organization kept running by generous donors like you. Support us today on patreon.com forward slash lineage journey. History shapes identity. Identity shapes mission, and a clear mission determines the trajectory of your future. Knowing where you come from is key to understanding your present purpose and your future mission. Lineage Journey is a series of videos that will take you on a journey through time, discovering the key people and events that have shaped the Christian faith. From the Waldenses to Martin Luther to Zwingli, from England to France, Switzerland to Germany, the light broke over the horizon of Europe piercing through the dark ages and then spread out over the world. 
As the United States of America rose to supremacy, Christianity formed the bedrock of this great nation. And so from the Great Awakening to the Great Disappointment and beyond, lineage follows the journey of God's church throughout time, immersing you in the places, the stories, and the people through whom Christianity has shone the brightest. Join us on a journey through time. Follow us on social media at Lineage Journey or check out our website at lineagejourney.com. Lineage Journey not only produces video content, but instructive and illuminating resources to teach young and old about Christian history. Lineage has produced an educational coloring book for people of all ages. It includes original artwork from Ashley Bloom, highlighting the various heroes of the Reformation. Each scene has a matching story, and there are also QR codes to connect you to the website for more information and to watch the videos. There are also fun facts and memorable quotes to accompany the scenes to color in. Designed for young and old alike, get your copy now at lineagejourney.com. So in the first part of this podcast, we looked at the Celtic church, who it referred to, that it was primarily in Scotland and Ireland though it may have been believers who retreated to those areas due to their geographical location on the edge of Europe. We also looked into St. Patrick and who he was and how he arose after the Council of Nicaea and how Patrick believed many things that uh, were from the Bible uh, in terms of the day he worshipped on, his belief on animals and diet and things like this. And and he trained other people and, and St. Patrick wasn't always the person who he has made out in common culture today. And that's something that's important for us to remember. And we also looked briefly at Columba and Iona. But as we continue in our discussion now, we're going to see a little bit more deeper into uh, the questions of Iona and the Celtic Church and how it expanded. So we would say today they were maybe ahead of their time. I'm guessing that wasn't normal back then. Um, They were kind of Counter, yeah. countercultural in the, in the way they treated animals and livestock in the what day they worshipped on and what is this what people sometimes refer to as apostolic faith or is that something well they certainly would say that they would say that their doctrines were based on the scriptures that they had they were not led by the council of nicaea like we mentioned mm-hmm. which had happened you know pretty near um, the time of patrick in fact he preached against it they mm-hmm. tried to co-opt him. They tried to get him to bow down and be subjugated to their views. He didn't do it. So, yeah, it was a primitive faith. And, in fact, the Protestant Reformation, when they looked back at um, antecedents to their own beliefs, they said they also tried to co-opt mm-hmm. uh, Patrick and Columba and say they were essentially precursors to the Protestant Reformation mm-hmm. and revivalism. So, Yeah. Well, the, in, in, I mean, the, the term Protestant hadn't been coined then. It was obviously coined at the protest of the princes later on. But in, in the sense that they were protesting against what the dominant church of their day taught, you, you would fit them under that category as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it, when they knew it, because they yeah. didn't know it. I mean, they were just up there worshiping on the basis. And didn't know they were different. No, they didn't know they were different until the Roman legions come up there. The Roman legions, they have all kinds of religions they try and establish, like Mithraism. And you go to these places in England and Scotland, they're worshiping Mithra. They have Mm -hmm. different uh, Roman gods, but they also are aware of what's happening ultimately then when they were co-opted in Roman Catholicism. And then uh, Augustine um, and others came up there and they attempted they saw these believers and they said, well, they just are wrong in a few things. Let's talk them into the fact that we're right and they're wrong. But they had their own counsel system. They had their own study of the Bible that was based basically on the word mm-hmm. and not on uh, the traditions of the, of, of the church that was to the south of them. And so, you know, they kept separate. In fact, they couldn't conquer the people, the Scots, the great Scots. I'm a Macintosh, right? Mm-hmm. They couldn't conquer them. And so they, in fact, uh, built a wall, Hadrian's Wall, um, along there, 
uh, with not just not just at the time of Patrick, but before he was built. Actually, he was born along Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall would have been like AD eighty, mm. right? So, but the Scots uh, again, they were the we often what well, we say the Scots. It was the the Pict tribe back then, wasn't it? Right. But that wasn't the Celt. Like when we said the Celtic Church, that wasn't the Picts. Didn't weren't the Picts like some other kind of? They they weren't. Uh, was it is it separate or were the the Celtics? Well, I think the I think the Celts and I think Christianity had converts among the Picts mm-hmm. and amongst all the tribes up there. So I don't know how you would fractionate that or not. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, the gospel came through the preaching of Patrick, and then later on, Columba and Columbanus, and they had uh, great converts within uh, the Scottish, uh, uh, you might say, pagan tribes like the Picts mm-hmm. and others, mm-hmm. and that's how they expanded. Mm-hmm. So, of course, you know, you have Columbanus, or Columba, then Columbanus. Columbanus stays there for a while, and you and I were talking. He heads to England, ultimately, then goes down to France. And so you see their ideas beginning to spread Mm -hmm. different places. So it wasn't a commune. You mentioned earlier, part of it was that they were trying to have a commune-style life, but at the same time, they were also evangelistic. Yeah, I mean, some historians say it was a unified entity separate from mainstream and kind of stayed to itself. Mm-hmm. But of course, you know, that can't be totally true because then it went beyond itself and they did have some groups that would go out and they would be captives for Christ, right? <laughs> mm. And they would, they would spread their ideas. You have church fathers like Tertullian and Origen in the third century that are talking about um, the Brits and what's happening up there. Um, but you have definitely, uh, you know, some of them heading out and sharing their, their concepts beyond hmm. and how could they not? Right. <laughs> mm. uh, I mean, I, I find this fascinating when you think about the, the map of Europe and the world at the time that there were these, these pockets of believers that still held on to faith that would have been passed down from the, the early church and the believers that was still in many ways hadn't been corrupted yet. And, and they were standing out against the, the dominant religious beliefs of their time. Um, so the work there kind of expanded. It went to different places. We have Columbanus who went to Wales, and then he went to France and then Italy. And obviously we had Aidan who came to England from Iona and evangelized England. Now and also and also Ireland. So Saint Patrick goes back to mm, mm-hmm. to Ireland, and then one of his followers, Finian of Clonard, mm-hmm. that guy was the guy that really was the one who said, "Look, let's treat the animals right, let's be vegetarians," and um, uh, you know, they were they were missionizing the Saxons in England, the Britain refugees, um, and and they were. Christianizing also Wales and Ireland and mm. England. Um, and the Irish in turn made Christians of the Picts and the English. And um, uh, where Iona was, a, was a called, I think it was called Del Riata. And these were actually what now is Scotland. And, um, you know, they reached there. Some think they, they also reached Cornwall, that area. Yeah, I've heard that, yeah. And, you know, even today, I think there's a lot of similarity with Cornish culture as Celtic culture. And, uh, yeah, that, that and was, in Wales as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So they, they, it doesn't seem like that far to us because we fly on jets, but that was fairly big. If you're on a rowing boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we have the Celtic church in, you know, five, six, seven hundreds. Um, but Today, we don't really have a Celtic church. We have Celtic music and other aspects of Celtic culture. Um, the Celtic church diminishing or becoming overrun, do you, do you know much on that in terms of when it kind of would have come to an end or how it would have come to an end? Because. Well, I mean, I think what you have is the Roman Catholic church becoming stronger and stronger, and they're confronting and they're actually sending, you know, missions to convert, for instance, to Anglo-Saxons and, you know, all these groups. And as far as I can see is that um, 
they eventually, you know, the Celtics kind of died out um, over over um, over time, and they just kind of you know slipped slipped away. Have you ever thought about like the Celtic jersey we have there in Scotland, and we have the Waldensians in Italy, um, who are up in the mountains, people of the the, the, the valleys, and so on. I mean, do you ever thought that it's kind of literally they were protected by the geographic landscape in which they live, that people actually couldn't get up to those regions easily? And so, you know, the Celts were in the mountains up there in Scotland and on some of the islands, and the Waldensians were up in the, the mountains of Italy where it wasn't easy access to get to. And so the people by default chose these locations that that, that protected them from in, in many ways. Sure. I mean, that's exactly true with the Waldensians. They go up and out of sight, out of mind, right? Mm. <laughs> and uh, it isn't until they have crusades against them and whatnot, and they kind of like the valleys that they go after them. And uh, this is certainly true. You had, you know, you had Hadrian's Wall. And, you know, when I went on my honeymoon to Iona, <laughs> my wife was like, where are we going? You know, <laughs> it was a, it's a even now. To it's, get a long, there's a, it's a mission. You that's gotta, a long way yeah. out there. And, um, you know, you, you can be catechizing, training, mm -hmm. indoctrinating, um, studying, reflecting, and pulling your thoughts and everything together before you go out on missions. Mm. It was a great place to do that. It still is a great place to do that. Do you think there was an element of the work that the, of Iona that, that was kind of even though it was extinguished en masse with the, you know, as a Catholic church kind of expanded across all known landmass in Europe, that there were still pockets of believers that when, say, John Knox or George Wishart came later on, that it was in some ways fertile ground for, for the gospel. Do you think there's a connection between that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's the whole point. There has always been like a remnant in different places. And when it was discovered, you know, like the anti-Roman movements, anti-Roman Catholic movements, like the Lollards, the followers of John Wycliffe, mm -hmm. that's much later, much later. But they all hearken back to this. They say, hey, look, um, you know, there are these pockets, and, and we can see that what we are now newly discovering by looking at the Bible ourselves, they already knew about it, and they would point to them. Mm. And they were like beacons of light, just like the Waldensians were in Italy, mm. you know. So, is this no. is this what Revelation refers to as the in, in chapter twelve? When it talks of the church in the wilderness? Yeah, I know. I, I I mean, you know, I've often just tied that to with the Waldensians, but I think these other groups certainly would be similar to that. Um, you know, they they were keeping truth alive based on the scriptures alone, the sola mm. scriptura principle. And um now, that doesn't mean they had everything necessarily straight, right? Because mm -hmm. they, they had the Druid influence and other influences and whatnot. They had their own councils and different things. Anytime you get man in the middle, it sometimes can muck things up. Mm -hmm. So, But certainly they, they kept the idea that the scriptures could be understood by studying themselves alone. They kept the idea that um, the health laws in the Old Testament were actually valid. They kept the idea that the Sabbath was still in existence. They kept the idea that not only should they take a rest, but so should the animals. And so they were kind to of animals. Mm -hmm. They took the idea that baptism was by immersion. Mm. They had their own penitential penance type systems, like what to do when you sinned and different things, which I'm not sure exactly what they came up with that, but they had their own doctrine and they were resistant to Rome when it came. And, the, and so, yeah, they, 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 and then they spread that. Like I said, it meant it went many different places. We know in the Bible that it was went to Gaul or Galatia, and then, like you mentioned, down to Italy and other places. It was a Latin Bible they had. Italo, I don't know. I mean, the Waldensians had their own ancient scriptures as well, mm -hmm. and that's much later, though. That's eleven yeah, hundred. Yeah. So, so. I think there's two things that are really coming out to me. Number one is, as you mentioned several times, is the is the desire to follow the scriptures that they had, and we see that they follow the scriptures that they had up to 
you know, to, to, to the, the best of their understanding, the best of their knowledge. And, and they put that into practice. They implemented it. In, and it, it wasn't just a intellectual belief, but it's something that changed their lifestyle, the way they lived. And also it had an impact on how they saw other people. And it led to an evangelistic fer fervor that they had. Now, maybe kind of kind of bring 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 this to, to, to current day. I mean, we don't, as I mentioned, no, we don't have a Celtic church today, but what lessons can we learn today um, for ourselves and our mission and our work and, and, and how can we apply these things from the past to us today? To someone who's listening. Well, I mean, I mean, it's very inspiring. I think Leslie Harding, um, who did a definitive work on the Celtic church, and he was the pastor in Edinburgh back in 1940 something <laughs> mm. or that era, you know, he went to the, the library there in Edinburgh and he did all kinds of research and this inspired him. By the way, he was reading a book called The Great Controversy and he was taking just a like one paragraph out of there that gave him the seed idea to look into yeah, all there's this. There's not much in The Great Controversy. Right. Them. Yeah. And he expanded that. And, you know, the um, there's even a revival in there is a revival of interest in Celtic Christianity, Celtic music. You have all kinds of searches for that. Uh, even today, um, and people see it as exotic. They see maybe as peripheral, you know, because it's not normal, um, but it's distinct. And I think that's a big lesson we can learn. You know, people don't, they're not interested in you if you're just the same as they are. This old saying, if, you know, both of us are completely alike, maybe one of us is unnecessary. So people like distinctiveness mm -hmm. and not contrived, you know, if it's based on the word. Um, people are interested in, like, for instance, if you say, I, I keep the Sabbath or the Sabbath keeps me, <laughs> they're interested in that. What does that mean? Where did that come from? They're interested if you eat a certain way. You're like, you go out and you are not eating this and you are eating that, and they're very interested. Now, you know, especially, I mean, in the United Kingdom, um, there's a lot more vegetarian options now than mm -hmm. there used to be when I went over there, and people, especially in London and other places, it's big. I mean, it's a big industry, but it's based more on a pagan mindset, mm. a Gnostic mindset uh, that God is in everything or that nature is actually God. But this is a different footing for it, isn't it? We're doing this because God's word said to do it. And that's another thing. It's another distinctive. Every meal becomes a message. It becomes a marketing ploy, if you mm. will, um, where they're going, why are you doing that? And then the way you treat animals. And then they also were known for not, you know, having the same uh, structure in their church. They had their own councils that were more friendly to both men and women, seeing not he versus she, but we in ministry. Mm -hmm. This is a powerful concept that people are even discovering now. So, and then also the mission aspect. And one of the big things we didn't mention before was they like to put the Psalms to meter, you know, mm. they would put them in their language. They could put them in a rhyme and they could remember them much uh, longer. I know when I was over there on my honeymoon there, even today in that you would call it an ecumenical center. Now it's not mm. so much yeah, as yeah. focused. They don't have the distinctives, but they certainly were singing these songs and they had the CDs and they had the, uh, they probably have MP3s there now where they were, you could listen to that music and it's very soothing and gripping music. Um, and, you know, I think um, this is something that is gripping people's attention again. And I think the lesson, the bottom line lesson is uh, distinctiveness based on the scriptures is gripping. Mm. The culture we live in today, people are looking for distinctives, I think. And I think as young people or anyone really, we need to seek to have our distinctives based on something bigger than ourselves, something broader and deeper and, and stronger than just ourselves. And like the Celtic Church, they, they, their distinctives are based on, on God's word. And as I understood that, and I think we as believers today should seek to have our distinctives based on, on God's word and have a rooting and grounding there. Yeah. So if people say one of the arguments of the Catholic Church is they say we're the oldest. So listen to us just because we're old. But this kind of gives a light of that too, because mm -hmm. they say, no, 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 no. They were there. Mm -hmm. You came and found them. Who knows how long they were there? Mm. And they were rooting themselves on the very things that you decided to move on from, in a sense. Mm. You know, so, you know, my birthday's January 18th. 
1562 at the Council of Trent, that's many centuries later, they got in this big argument of would they follow sola scriptura or would they follow tradition? And a bunch of people within the Roman church were gripped by the Protestant Reformation, which was built on the Celtic understanding. Mm -hmm. They co-opted it, and they said, we want to just do the Bible like them in some senses. And they, they got into a big argument. And on January 18, my birthday, there was a guy that came in. His name was Archbishop of Reggio. And he came in, and he said, you know what? Here's the answer. The answer is this. All these churches that proclaim to be following the Bible and the Bible only, they worship on Sunday. And guess what? We changed that. And we changed it back time of the Constantine, which is right around the time of Patrick, mm -hmm. right around that time. We changed it, and and everybody follows this. Yeah, everybody did, except the Celts, except for Patrick, except for Colum, you know, Columba. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but anyway, that was the big thing. They said, our tradition is inspired. Our councils are inspired. You need to follow us. We'll define things for you. And, and it sounds like that's true. I mean, it looks like that's the majority. Until you know about the Celts, until you know about Columbanus, until you know about the Waldensians, until you know about Patrick, until you know about Columba. And then mm. you go, no, 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 no. That's not the only option from antiquity. Mm. I think it's, I think it's fascinating. So their, their story stands as an inspiration and also goes against sometimes conventional whitewashed history so to speak and 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 so thank you for in sharing with us and enlightening us and and the celtic church really uh, like you said they're only mentioned maybe a paragraph or two in great controversy but the impact i think is much broader than just a paragraph and they really made a, a mark in in the british isles but also further afield and they stand as a a witness um against the enroachment of the papacy for many many years yeah and we also today should stand for principle stand for conviction and stand on God's word as people in, in years past did, according to as God leads us and guides us. So thank you for joining us and thank you for sharing with us. And uh, hope hopefully one day we, we'll get over there to Scotland again when the world opens up. And I know we've talked about walking Hadrian's Wall together sometime. So. We've got to do it. We've got to get, uh, Clive might have 14 kids by then, but if we can pull him away from uh, from from the, uh, you know, the press of the world all around. Yeah, you can go you. with us. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. It'd be a nice little walk. So thank you, Don, for joining us. And we've discussed briefly the, the Celtic church and some of the key players in that church. And we've seen the role that they played. And, and thank you for highlighting some of the key parts of their life and how that they were standing up and they were going against the culture, the dominant culture of their day, and that they were, they put truth and they put the Bible above everything. And I just want to encourage some of our listeners out there who may be living in a house or living in a community or attending a school where you are, in a sense, you, you feel that everything is going against you and you feel that everyone is believing a different way to you and for you to, to, to believe as your conscience uh, directs you and as God's word directs you, you're going to be seen as a little bit different. You're going to be seen as a little bit peculiar and and, and the celtic church they they weren't big but they were faithful to god's word as they understood it and i want to encourage those of you who are listening to be faithful to god's word and to be faithful to your conscience and to be faithful to as god leads you and as god guides you because that's all god asks of us he asks us to be faithful to him he asks us to follow him according to the light and knowledge that we understand so that's the important thing for us to apply i believe to our lives today so thank you once again for listening to this podcast and I pray that as you continue to follow us on this journey that you will be enlightened, motivated and inspired. The Lineage Journey podcast is supported by each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. And if you're interested in supporting us financially, you can do so at patreon.com slash lineage journey. Please do follow us on our website at lineagejourney.com where there's much, much more resources and materials both video content and written that you can check out and also across social media at lineage journey on facebook on youtube on instagram and on twitter follow us on socials and be updated when new content comes out thank you for joining us may god bless you and hopefully see you in a few weeks on our next podcast thank you for listening we hope that you enjoyed this episode lineage journey is supported by your generous donations did you know that you can donate on a monthly basis? Any amount from $2 to 100 or whatever you decide through patreon.com forward slash lineage journey. Your donations go towards the cost of producing our varied content and we thank you for your support.